Okay, so um, as you know, my name is Trevor Holster. I'm the uh, vetting committee chair. So the first thing is quickly, what do I do? What does the vetting, vetting committee chair do? So I recruit reviewers and maintain a database of reviewers. And thanks to our volunteer reviewers, um, we have about 50 reviewers uh, currently, and I'm trying to uh, increase the size of the reviewer pool. So then I assign reviewers to abstracts that are submitted online. And that's thanks to Paul Collette, who runs the, um, the website. He's been doing that for about 20 years. Uh, so he's put in a lot of time and effort into the conference over the years. So then I get the data from that website and I analyze the data to rank all of the submissions. So which are the, the, the best and which are the, the not best. Uh, and then I pass that data onto the conference planning committee. So Wayne Melkman, Jean-Pierre Richard are the people I deal with, but there are numerous others on that committee. Um, so there's a lot of people involved in putting this conference together, and they're all volunteers. So how did I become the vetting committee chair? Well, that's thanks to Bill Pallow. Um, I went to the conference one year and saw a possibly dishonest presenter who basically didn't have a presentation that was nothing at all to do with what was in the conference handbook. I talked to Bill and he'd actually seen the same thing, possibly the same person in previous years. So we got to this question of how can we improve the vetting process? And Bill talked to the uh, conference committee. It actually took quite a few years before we got permission. Uh, and so I became the conference data analyst. Um, thanks to Chris Perotto, who was the previous vetting committee chair. So I, I did the data analysis for a few years. And then Chris just didn't have time to continue. And so I took over as the vetting committee chair in 2023. So there's been a lot of people working on this over the years. Now, um, the call for presentations is out up on the JOLT website. And an important thing to understand is there are two big different types of proposals. There are unvetted submissions and vetted ones. So I deal with the vetted submissions. And these are vetted by a committee. The deadline is March the 10th. So do not miss that deadline. Now, there are different formats of presentation. There are research-oriented presentations and practice-oriented workshops. These can be 25 short 25-minute ones or long 60-minute ones. There are also forums and poster sessions, which are 90 minutes. So there's, there's a, a lot of different formats in there. Now, how many proposals are submitted? Well, typically 500 to 700. Uh, the number dropped after, after the COVID pandemic. We're hoping to increase it again. Last year, there were 413 uh, submissions for 25-minute presentations. There were 53 for 60-minute presentations and 69 for 90-minute sessions. But that includes SIG forums and all sorts of other business. So there's actually not a lot of 90-minute submissions. Um, how many are accepted? Well, we can't accept every proposal. There are many slots for poster sessions. Um, there are a lot more slots for 25-minute sessions than 60- and 90-minute sessions. The problem is that unvetted proposals reduce the number of available slots for the vetted proposals. So SIG, uh, SIGs are allotted a 90-minute slot for a forum. So every SIG can take a 90-minute slot. Um, chapters can sponsor a first-time presenter. That's a 25-minute slot. So those go in ahead of vetted um, proposals. Also, associate members um, are given slots. Um, and so the vetted submissions, the vetted proposals, come in right at the end of the queue. Okay. So how many are accepted? Well, it depends on the venue. So how many rooms are available? And how many unvetted proposals are there? So in 2023, from my count, it's difficult to get exact numbers, but I counted 339 25-minute presentations, but that includes unvetted um, presentations such as uh, first-time presenters. Uh, there were 54 60-minute presentations, but that will also include some unvetted 
um, uh, presenters. And 90 minute presentations, I don't know, because that includes SIG meetings and unvetted forums and things. So basically, um, we cannot accept everything that is, is submitted. So the unvetted proposals, today we're talking mostly talking about the vetted ones, but it's important for people to understand that every chapter um, is allowed to sponsor one first-time presenter. So if you have never presented at the JOLT conference before, um, you can talk to your chapter officers and see if they are willing to sponsor you for the um, the international conference. That's an unvetted um, submission. Um, if you're a member of a SIG and you're active in your SIG, every SIG is allowed a forum. So this is actually, a, a, in many ways, a much easier way to get into the conference than having to go through the vetting process. So don't write off the unvetted um, proposals. You, you might be able to get in on one of those. Now, how are proposals vetted? This is really important to understand. They are blind reviewed by three reviewers and then rank ordered from the highest to lowest using what is called a fair average score, which I'll explain a little bit about later. The highest rated proposals are chosen to fill the number of available slots. So however many 25 minute slots are available, the conference organizers, organizing committee, simply go down the list and select the top, you know, however many slots they have. The same with 60 minute and 90 minute um, submissions. So many, many perfectly good abstracts must be rejected because there are not enough slots available. So we use a four item rubric, um, clarity organization and title, theoretical pedagogical soundness, the knowledge or skill contribution, and overview of content. Okay, so one important thing to understand is the conference um, theme is not explicitly part of the rubric. So you should try and uh, write to the conference theme if you can, but um, it's not part of the rubric. So we use an eight point rating scale, uh, basically, one to two is a very poor um, submission, three to four is marginal, five to six is good, and seven to eight is exceptional. So really to be accepted, you need to be getting your scores, you know, six, seven, or eight. If you, if you get a four, if you rate it as four on pretty much anything on the rubric, you're probably not going to get in. So you have to have a really good um, abstract. Now, the data analysis. Um, so we use what's called many faceted rash measurement. And the reason I do this is it allows us to measure the rate of severity and adjust for that. Because rate is a human and humans differ in the severity of their judgments. So if you are unfortunate enough to have even one really severe rater, that would doom your submission. If you have a, a really lenient rater, you have a really good chance of getting in. That's not fair. So we use many faceted rash analysis to adjust for the rate of severity. So we can do that if the raters are consistently more lenient or severe. We can adjust for that. And that's how we generate the fair average score. Um, so I'll I'll just give you a very quick illustration of many faceted rash measurement. This is a research project I did a few years ago with actual based speaking tests. In this, there were 10 trained and certified raters, okay, because this test was used, uh, developed for very high stakes decisions, such as sending um, corporate uh, staff overseas for internships. And there were 20 Japanese university students. So looking here, what we can see is at the very, we have a column here for persons. So P person 02 is the highest ability person. So on the left, we have a, a scale of ability and difficulty, so the, the top person. And person 17 was the lowest ability person. There's a very wide range of, of um, ability there. 
Now, in the next column, we have the raters. We have our 10 raters here, and rater 9 is the most severe, the strictest rater. Rater 7 is the most lenient rater. So what we can see is that the difference in the rater severity is actually very large. So, for example, person 13 is a pretty good um, speaker overall. But if that person was rated by rater 9, they would drop down to about where person 19 is if person 19 was then rated by rater 7. So what we can see is the severity of the raters is actually a huge factor. The luck of which rater you get would make a big difference. So we use rash analysis to adjust for that. Now, um, we have to adjust for that. We use fair average scores to make it fair. Now, um, this is what the output from our software looks like. We have a observed average and a fair average, and these differ a little bit because it's adjusted for the rate of severity. Now, the reason I showed you that instead of the conference data is because it wasn't really 10 different raters. That was me rating at 10 different times, six months apart. Um, now, I was trained and certified for these speaking tests. I had a lot of experience on this, and I differ at different times. So when teachers tell me that they are experts and you know they're really good at this, it's like, no, no. Um, humans are really not consistent in their judgments. So we have to adjust for that. So we use rash analysis to try and make it fair. If you want to hear more about that, Tim McNamara, Ute Nock, and Jason Fan have an excellent book called Fairness, Justice, and Language Assessment. Um, okay, now we can adjust for the rate of severity as long as raters are consistently different. But if they are really idiosyncratic, we can identify that through fit analysis and we send the proposals to another rater. So every proposal is rated at least three times, but possibly more if we identify idiosyncratic rating behavior. And looking back at that data, we can see here there's a, a couple of columns called mean square infit and outfit, and we use that. If this number gets too high, if it's above about 1.5, then we send the proposal off to a um, a further round of rating. Okay, so that's how we analyze the data. Um, so what do the reviewers see? The reviewers see the abstract. They don't see any identifying information. And I, I don't have access to the identifying information. Only Paul Collette can access that. Uh, we see the title, the reference list, the content area, and the context. So what is not considered? author background and content area because we can't see it. And there are no quotas for content area in the conference. Okay, so there, there aren't, for example, a set number of slots for testing proposals or for, um, for example, technology um, call proposals. And there are no quotas for research or practice oriented proposals. Okay, so those are not really a consideration. So how to get accepted, you have to write a good abstract because the only thing the reviewers see is your abstract. If it's well written, you will be accepted. If it's poorly written, you will not be accepted. So when you go to the online submission, get the details correct. You can only submit one proposal as the main presenter and have your name on one other proposal. If you exceed that, um, one of your submissions will be booted out. And if you mess around and waste people's time, you will be booted out of the conference entirely. Um, and the other important thing is all presenters must register for and attend the conference. If you don't register for the conference, your name won't be in the, in the uh, conference handbook. Now, so you have to submit a title for your um, for your submission. That, that is limited to 60 characters, including spaces. So you must obey this or it will just be cut off. If you submit, uh, for example, many-faceted 
uh, rash analysis classroom dynamic peer assessment that will be cut off at 60 characters and it will say dynamic peer assets, which is very amusing, but uh, it will not impress the, um, the reviewers. You must include a short summary, 75 words or 150 Japanese characters. This is only used in the conference handbook. The reviewers do not consider this. So it's a sales pitch to attract an audience at the conference. It doesn't affect whether you get into the conference or not. There are learning and teaching contexts. Um, these are used by the scheduling committee to try and balance the schedule. This is not used for vetting. Okay. Now this is confusing because there's teaching contexts and there is also the content area. The content area is important. These are aligned with SIGs, and the reviewers are assigned as much as we can based on the content area. So we will try to assign reviewers who are experts in the content area. So think very carefully about which content area you're going to submit to. Um, a common problem is people submit to the technology content area. Even though they're using technology, the abstract isn't really about the technology. And the technology reviewers, you know, come back to me and say, we, we can't really um, rate this because we don't understand what they're talking about. It should have been submitted to a different content area. So think carefully about your content area. And the most important thing is the abstract. 100 and 150 to 250 words. This is really the only thing that determines acceptance or rejection. So use the word limit, but do not exceed it. Okay. If your abstract is too short, it will be um, rejected. Include references to existing literature. Even if you're writing a, um, a classroom practice oriented um, abstract, you really need references to the existing literature and do not include personally identifying information. And the key thing, structure your abstract for clarity. So a little bit about references. There is now a separate data entry section for references and they're not counted in the abstract word limit. So use the APA format. So within the text, you have author and year. And in the reference list, author, year, title, journal name, issue, pages, DOI. For example, within the text, the study extended Holster and Lake's 2016 analysis of guessing behavior to include. And then in the reference section, you'll see the standard APA format. Okay, now your references should be anonymous, but if you refer to your own published work, do that in the third person. Okay. The reason for this is that raters are usually associated with SIGs and will be familiar with the major publications. If you identify yourself as author for a known publication, raters can identify you. For example, if somebody wrote, this paper extends the author's 1905 model of the invariance of frames of reference, it's very easy to guess who the author is. Anybody care to guess? The Einstein? Yes. Anybody who read this would say, ah, this is Einstein. Okay. It's such a, you know, it's one of the most famous papers in the history of physics. So if you identify yourself as that, the author of that paper, you're not anonymous. So refer to yourself in the third person. So from the website, uh, factors that strengthen, okay, familiarity with current practice and crew include references to well-known publications and authors, not junk publications, but well-known publications. Well-written, edited and proofread. Now a clear three-step order, background information, problem addressed, exactly what will be attended to in the presentation. So. Factors that weaken it, too short, too general, no details or examples are given, carelessly written. Now, 
Um, I have a lot of sympathy for people who are writing in a second language. I can overlook, you know, sometimes it's clumsy and we, we can tell. But um, if you're a native English, native speaker, English professor working at a university, you should be able to write English to a professional level. And if you write lazy, sloppy work, um, you are not going to be accepted. Okay, so the abstract structure, three-step order. Really the background of the problem. Okay, foreground, what is the problem? And then details of the solution. So before I show you an example of an abstract, um, use a plain text editor. The character sets in standard word processing um, software like Microsoft Word can cause problems when the document is converted to plain text. So you, you upload it and then it becomes unreadable. So check it in a plain text editor. So for example, in Windows, you have Notepad. So for example, here's a reference that um, has a non-standard character that the plain text um, cannot reproduce. So check for problems like this. Okay, now let's um, just need to go to the chat. I'm going to put an abstract into the chat. So in the chat, you should see two example abstracts. One is as a Word document, the other is as plain text document. So Okay, so I've stopped my screen sharing and if you take a look at those um, abstracts, you can see there are several versions of the abstract. So Bill, can we put people into breakout rooms and um, I'd like people to discuss those different versions of the abstract and look at the structure of them. Okay, so what we saw there were um, three different versions of the same abstract. So the first one was um, accepted for the conference last year. Um, I tried to emphasize growth because that was the conference theme, but you know it, it's not a main part of the uh, major part of the vetting, but um, um, it's good to reference it if you can. Now, just to clarify, uh, if I submit an abstract that goes through exactly the same process, and blind review process, um, I, don't, I don't get any automatic um, pass into the conference. Now, the other two abstracts just were poorly structured. They were intended to show um, poor structure. Number three was just a whole bunch of techno jargon. It might be acceptable at a... Uh, a language testing conference, but for a general conference like JOLT, you know, nobody knows what all that nonsense is. Um, the second example uh, was really missing a whole bunch of background stuff. And so, and they were too short. So you have 250 words. So you need to use those words and follow that structure. So that's the, this is what the reviewers see. They see an abstract like that. Um, and they have, have to make a judgment, you know, and, and reviewers are looking at 40 to 50 abstracts. Um, so, you know, they're not going to spend an hour going through it. Okay, so you, you need to make it easy for the reviewers to like you. Now, um, I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint, if I can. We have about 50 reviewers. Um, and last year, there was a about 500 submissions, each has to be rated three times. So you're looking at 30 uh, abstracts per re reviewer on average, but you know, many reviewers are uh, reviewing 40 or 50 abstracts. So they, there's not a lot of time to review these. Now, the we try to assign reviewers with a relevant background as much as we can, but it's not always possible to guarantee that. So you know, not every rater is going to be an expert in the content area. Um, and if you submit something highly technical, full of jargon, like abstract three, reviewers won't know what you're talking about. So, you know, you need to avoid that. Okay, so let's go back to the rubric. Um, there are four rubric items. 
clarity, organization, title, theoretical, pedagogical soundness, knowledge of skill contribution, and overview of content. Now, research-oriented and classroom practice-oriented abstracts are evaluated using the same rubric. There's no separate rubric for these. So, if you submit a classroom practice-oriented abstract, you need to reference the existing literature. It's very unlikely you've invented something truly without precedent, so please don't invent dictogloss again. I've seen two people who think they invented something new, and it's just dictogloss. Okay, so if they'd gone back through the literature, they would have found that what they were doing was not actually um, as uh, <clears throat> without precedent as they thought. Um, so you need to write a clear and concrete description of the contents of your presentation. What will the audience learn? Okay, so I'll, I'm going to put the uh, put the rubric into the chat. Um, okay, so the rubric is in the chat, and so please download that rubric. Okay, so in the rubric, we can see that um, item one is clarity, organization, and title. Okay, so it should be clear, concise, well-organized, should have been thoroughly proofread with no obvious errors, take on the role of copy editor, can writing quality be improved. The title of the proposal should be directly related to the content. And then item two, we have the theoretical and pedagogical soundness. So the proposal should reflect familiarity with current practice theory and or research, the assumptions, premises and or empirical design upon which the proposal is based should be sound. In addition, um, it should appear that any necessary research has already been conducted. It should not read as a research proposal. So if you talk about research that you're going to do, you'll pretty much certainly be rejected. Um, you need to talk about research that is complete. So saying you're going to gather data will not um, impress reviewers. So item three, the knowledge or skill contribution. So it should produce new input in the form of up-to-date research or activities. Uh, for example, three workshops that will help participants gain new knowledge and or skills. Highly rated presentation should make a strong contribution to one, both areas. And it should be noted that participants in the proposed session should be thought of as individuals involved in language teaching. Do not think of participants as sick members of the proposed content area or highly experienced individuals within that field. So if you write a abstract like the third example I gave, um, it's not of any use to teachers. So Joel at a teaching conference, um, it's not a, um, a conference for language testing. Um, so write your abstract for teachers. An overview of content, item four in the rubric, there should be an adequate explanation of what will be covered in the presentation and what is listed should be realistic for the length of the presentation. For workshops, it should be clear what new skill the participants will learn to do. Okay, so you need to be very clear what people are going to get out of it. That's easy for a research uh, abstract. You can talk about your results, but for a workshop, you have to explain exactly what you're going to do. Okay, so in summary, we have too many good submissions to accept all of them. We have to reject a whole lot. They're rated by three raters. We adjust for rater severity, and we try to adjust for inconsistent raters, but ultimately it's going to come back to have you written a good abstract. So now let's uh, go back to looking at abstracts. So I'm going to put some more examples into the uh, chat. And I'd like you to, again, go to um, breakout rooms and quickly look at these. So abstract two and abstract three are 
a research oriented and a practice oriented abstract on similar on related um, topics and then uh, after that there are a couple of other practice oriented abstracts so please look at abstract two and abstract three first and then take a look at the other two and discuss them in terms of the rubric so let's uh, look at that for maybe 15 minutes bill basically abstract two was a research oriented submission that was accepted several years ago mm. um it doesn't have a reference list because back then there was no separate reference list section and if you included the reference list it cut into your word count so the smart thing to do was to not include a reference list now there is a separate section for a reference list so you absolutely should include a reference list well, um, can i ask the question real quick yes. yeah so regarding references uh sometimes you might have like seven or eight or nine or ten references you want to cite for a specific thing but obviously like what should you do just the most pertinent reference or most recent what's your advice for if someone wants to cut down the number of references well i i always go with the most famous person um you know but basically the most pertinent so for example i cited calder keiko calder who wrote a book so it's a, it's a very general book it's not a research paper um I think that's a safe way to do it. But, you know, the, these are really good questions. Um, so the research-oriented proposal, the assumption is it will be reviewed by people who know about testing from the, from the language testing SIC. So um, hopefully they will understand the jargon. But the big problem is, you know, you're talking about something technical, and you don't know whether the reviewers will understand the jargon. So that's a really big question. Um, abstract three, the workshop proposal, uh, that's not a real one. I, I wrote that so that it's on the same theme, you know, related theme to the research proposal. And it's much harder to come up with concrete results. So it's specifically, what are we going to talk about? What are you going to learn? And I actually find those much harder to write than a research um, abstract um, the other two those are written by a um, AI those are written by chat AI just to show um, what happens when people unleash um, this so they're, they're, they're just jargon terms okay uh, there, there's no such thing as iterative intentionality it's just two jargon terms mashed together same with synergizing into language but the problem is that reviewers don't know you know, we get these jargon-filled abstracts, and we don't know, is this a real thing or not? Um, and with AI, it can be really hard to tell as well. So you want to write to make it really clear that this wasn't written by an AI just spouting jargon. Um, okay, that's everything I have to say. I think I've talked too long. So now, if people have uh, abstracts that they want to discuss, we could go to breakout rooms